He cannot protect everyone, said Galor. He is mighty, but he is no god. Then the other warrior cocked his head. Or is he? Garrow said nothing, refusing to be baited. Long before the Siege of Terror had begun, even before the Warmaster's betrayal, there were those who considered the Emperor of Mankind as more deity than mortal. They had many names, the followers of the Lecticio Divinitatus, True Kind, Imperiads, Lightbringers, and many expressions of their devotion, such as it was. Garrow did not consider himself among any of these groups, but he did believe, he did have faith. It was only when called upon to fully quantify that conviction that words failed him. I have faced death many times, against impossible odds, and still I live, he murmured. There must be a reason, by the throne. Once I was told that I was of purpose. I choose to hold to that still. He looked away. Call it what you will, brother. I care not if you think I am deluded. To his surprise, Galor gave a rare, if bitter, laugh. <laughs> I would not dare to. And in days as dark as these, who am I to challenge what gives a warrior succor? No, I only sought to know if your attitude has shifted on such matters. I see it has not. Oh, it has, Garrow corrected, a grim solemnity sweeping over his expression. My faith has been tested again and again, but never as gravely as now. He gestured towards the ruins heaped at the horizon. Terror burns about us in such profusion that a single sword, a single bolt gun cannot hope to turn back the fire. I have lent my aid to the palace's defenders wherever I can, wandering between the battlements and donjons, and yet the taint of futility is forever at my back. Galor nodded. I feel it too. When Horus's fleet had come, when his ships had darkened the sky, some stirring of martial exhilaration had been reborn in Garrow's twin hearts. He stood with an ersatz kinsman, Garvio Loken, and made ready for battle of such glory that it would be sung of for ten thousand years. But the reality of the grinding, monstrous siege war had burned through that. The great imperious scope of the palace city-state, once the venerated jewel of terror, had become a hellish crater filled with shed blood and the detritus of brutal war. An inescapable foreboding filled his soul as if sensing the great cogs of some unseen mechanism turning about him. Garrow felt the fates were aligning in ways he could only guess at. And now, with his lost legion on the approaches, and with his former Primarch marching somewhere among their number, the true power of something he rarely knew gripped him. Fear. He is out there, said Garrow, voicing the fort. Mortarion, Galor knew of whom he spoke grimacing around the name. Our traitor lord come to plague us anew. I. The legends of the Legiones Astartes are numerous in their deeds of valor, treachery, and martial prowess. Warriors without peer gifted immense autonomy and power to shift the fate of humanity's destiny. Such souls would prove to be both paragons and champions of both virtuous and despicable actions. For today, to mark the second anniversary of the remembrances of the Imperium, we shall elucidate the full account of among the most venerated Astartes to ever fight in the name of the Emperor. The former battle captain of the Death Guard Legion, Nathaniel Garrow. With the renewal of humanity's resolve under the guidance of the Master of Mankind, a new era virgined. Resolving to unite mankind's fragmented fiefdoms and empires across the stars, the man known simply as the Emperor began his quest to unify humanity's ancient homeworld into the foundations of his Imperium. The wars of unification waged by the Thunder Warriors of old had proven effective at culling the dissidents of terror, yet had proven unworthy of continuing the Emperor's crusade across the expanse of the galaxy. To bring about a new age of prosperity, a new breed of warriors would be forged and earn the moniker of his angels. Created to bring compliance to the remnant rebellions and uprisings upon terror, twenty legions of Astartes had been drawn from the world's populaces 
to enact the final hammer blow against the detractors of the Emperor. Of such legiones Astartes, the 14th, drawn from the techno-barbarian state of Albia, had earned a reputation clad in armor of marble adorned with a halved skull and black sun. Dusk Raiders, they were called. As the red right hand of the Emperor, they in turn had coated their right arm plating in glistening crimson and fought as unstoppable and relentless warriors. Their reputation alone causing their foes to lay down their arms the moment Terra's sun dipped below the horizon, few dared to oppose such an efficient and deadly force. Among such soldiers, a young man also of Albion heritage rose through the ranks as a stoic and honorable warrior. A man by the name of Nathaniel Garrow. Gifted a patrician demeanor befitting a noble warrior of Terra's ancient legends, his pale skin patterned with scars bore a weary countenance and old eyes belying his youth. Earning many plaudits and battle honors for his service as the Legion embarked upon the Great Crusade, the 14th spent over half a century waging war without the guidance of their gene sire. Nathaniel rose to the rank of a respected captain of the Legion and fostered great respect from his peers of brother legionaries for his impeccable service. Forming bonds of great friendship with the captain of the Lunar Wolves, Garviel Loken, during the Crypt Campaign against the Greenskins, and captain of the Emperor's children, Saul Tarvitz, during the Preexor Campaign, Garrow would regard only the most cherished of his allies as brothers in arms. Considering Saul Tarvitz to be his honor brother for his shared embodiment of the Imperium's ideals, the two Astartes each carved half of the Imperial Aquila into the ceramite of their vambraces. When both clasped their wrists in a show of friendship, the Imperial Aquila would form and symbolize their eternal bond as brothers forged in war. Yet during 854.M41, the Legion's Primarch would be found upon the world of Barbarus. A noxious world once ruled by malevolent necromancers, fate had been unkind to the young Primarch, molded by misfortune, slavery, and morbidity. With the Emperor's intervention, the so-called Pale King of Barbarus would be installed as the rightful leader of the 14th Legion and begin his task of remolding them in his image. A transformation which would contrast with the character of the noble son of Albia. As the Great Crusade continued to wage, with Mortarion installed as the Primarch of the 14th Legion, the Dusk Raiders culture and heritage began to be supplanted. Recruiting new Astartes solely from Barbarus, the Terrans within the Legion began to dwindle as six of the seven captains of the battle companies had been replaced with the stock of Mortarion's foster world. Leading the seventh great company as its battle captain, a title originally conferred to Garrow's predecessor of the seventh company by the Emperor himself, Nathaniel Garrow watched his legion transform into the now Death Guard, derived from the struggle of his Primarch's ascension as the Death Lord. Foreseeing a day when all Astartes of the 14th would be of barbarian descent, Garrow lamented the loss of his legion's warrior creed. Fearing his legion's noble character to be intertwined with the heritage and glories of the Dusk Raiders, their once noble character seemed destined to give way to merciless, cold slaughter. Seen as high-handed for his refusal to abandon his Terran traditions, a rift would begin to grow between Nathaniel Garrow and his peers. Nicknamed Straight Arrow Garrow by the commander of the Second Great Company, Ignatius Grilgore, Nathaniel's rejection to accept offers to join the Legion's Warrior Lodge further compounded the mistrust and disdain of the Barbaran Astartes. Seeing his customs to be holding back the prosperity and growth of the Legion's character, the Barbaran Space Marines openly derided individuals such as Nathaniel's housecarl, Caleb Aaron, whom in turn had failed to succeed in the trials to become an Astartes of the Death Guard. The Death Guard's character further soured with the ascension of the appointment of the title of War Master to the Emperor's chosen son, Primarch Horus Lupical, with the conclusion of the Ulanor Crusade. Nathaniel's lauded victories during the Jorgul persecution, fighting alongside the Sisters of Silence, earned great valor for his legion, leading to his Primarch to honor Garrow with a celebratory ritual to conclude their campaign. 
a ritual given to one Astartes for each victory made in the name of the 14th. Mortarion presented two goblets filled with deadly toxins, chemical agents, contaminants, and viral strains to test the most vaunted Death Guard in their resilience to consuming such poisons. Refusal to drink was a sign of weakness and a slight made against the Pale King, and so Nathaniel Garrow did drink the poisonous concoction derived from sword beetle venom, magenta nerve bane, and other unidentified compounds. A sign of respect and fealty to his liege lord for their shared participation in battle, Garrow once consuming the draft of poison further proved himself loyal to his Primarch. For despite his peers' contempt, Mortarion bore a great bond of respect for the battle captain of his 7th grade company, even though his continued refusal to adopt his homeworld's creed jarred with his vision for a united legion. Showing Garrow through such a gesture that he valued his loyalty, Mortarion spoke with Nathaniel following their toast to gauge his true loyalties. For unknown to Nathaniel, a plot was brewing within the ranks of his legion. Seeking answers to why Nathaniel had refused to join the Warrior Lodge of the 14th and his dismissal to adopt his legion's new beliefs, the son of ancient Albia could not be swayed from his ideals. A true scion of the Emperor, Nathaniel would sacrifice his life, reputation, and honor in the name of the Imperium and its master, no matter what treachery might seek to sway him. Fueled by his purpose to gather the lost fragments of humanity to the banner of the Imperium, and castigate the threats to humanity, Garrow's clear vision for a prosperous future ruled by the master of mankind could not be corrupted. Distrustful of superstitions such as the Lodges, and unswerving in his belief that the Emperor alone could hearken a new era for mankind, such proclamations sealed Garrow's fate. Understanding his venerated son to be incorruptible in that moment, Mortarion though disappointed at the prospect of the death of his battle captain, began his plot to cull the Loyalist ranks within his own legion. Appointing Garrow as his personal equerry, Mortarion joined the Conclave aboard the now Sons of Horus flagship, the Vengeful Spirit, as the assembled legion saw to the compliance of Istvan Extremis. Joining the Emperor's Children's First Company in their deployment to the outermost planet of the Istvan system, a rebellion of unknown origin had erupted upon its surface. Leading his 7th Great Company in their battle against the Slaneshi corrupted forces led by the Psyker entities known as the Warsinger, Nathaniel fought valiantly against his unknown foe. Wounded during the battle, Garrow's injuries included damage to his arm, chest, and the loss of his right leg from below the mid-thigh. Treated for his injuries by the Chief Apothecary of the 3rd Legion, Fabius Bile, with the intervention of his honor brother, Saul Tarvitz, and the Lord Commander of the Emperor's Children, Eidolon, Nathaniel would not die upon Istvan Extremis. Replacing his severed limb with a bionic prosthesis, Garrow's new augmetic would take time to adjust to the healing stump of his leg. Declared unfit to continue fighting at the head of his 7th Great Company by his Legion's apothecaries, Nathaniel's injury proved a merciful reprieve from the treachery soon to follow. Ordered by First Captain of the Death Guard, Callus Typhon, to remain aboard the void ship Eisenstein, the captain of the Second Great Company, Ignatius Grulgor, would covertly be tasked with watching Garrow for signs of treachery by Typhon. In orbit of Vistvan III, the Seventh Company stood as reserves for the battle taking place upon the surface, centered around its capital, the Coral City. Suspicious of Grulgor's intentions and the ship's change in position to low orbit, as warriors of the Emperor's children, World Eaters, Death Guard and Sons of Horus fought the rebellion below, Nathaniel's misgivings would be investigated by his house Carl. Caleb Aaron began to spy on Commander Grulgor until reaching the transport bay of the ship. Discovering crates filled with virus bombs within, Caleb with the aid of the 7th Great Company apothecary, Merrick Voyan, relayed his findings to Nathaniel Garrow. Yet time was against them as the trap of the traitors would be sprung. Receiving a transmission from a Thunderhawk gunship departed from the 3rd Legion Voidcraft, Andronicus, its trajectory was pursued by a cluster of Raven interceptors. Ordered by the Andronicus to fire upon the Thunderhawk, 
Nathaniel deferred to his better judgment to hear the transmission being sent by the renegade craft. Hearing the voice of Saul Tarvitz, his honor brother warned Garrow that treachery was afoot. Horus has betrayed the Emperor, Saul shouted, as he relayed his own findings that the ships in orbit would soon bombard the planet. Divulging his findings to his master, the returned Caleb Aaron and Merrick Voyan explained their discovery to Nathaniel. Realizing with horror the intent of such a cargo, Gulgor's men intended to fire the Life Eater virus bomb payload on top of the Astartes forces currently deployed upon Istvan III. Such deadly payloads were world-killing in their potency and used only during the most dire of campaigns. Firing upon the Raven interceptors to allow for Saul's traversal to the surface of Istvan III, it would not take long until Grugor intervened. Declaring to Garrow that the Emperor held no authority over the Death Guard Legion, only the War Master and their Primarch Mortarian had the right to command them. Battling Grulgor's men, the Death Guard Astartes fought within close proximity of the virus bomb warheads. Saving Nathaniel's life from a bolt pistol round fired by Grulgor, Caleb Aaron, for his valor, received reprisal from the commander of the Second Great Company. Grulgor hurled his combat knife at Caleb, with the House Carl incurring a mortal wound, yet would not allow for his noble master to die this day. The errant bolt round of Grulgor's pistol ricocheted into the metal bulkhead of a virus bomb warhead, now primed to vent lethal toxins within the Eisenstein. Exhausting the last ounce of his strength, Caleb Aaron hurled himself towards the emergency release switch of the cargo hold, trapping Grulgor, the virus contagion, and the traitor Astartes. Blast shield doors sealed the compartment between Garrow and Caleb as the virus bomb consumed all life within the compartment to agonizing effect. Assembling the remainder of his loyal kin to his side, Nathaniel declared their new mission of paramount import. They must warn the Emperor of the impending betrayal. Betrayed by the traitor Primarchs Horus, Fulgrim, Angron, and their own liege Mortarion, the seventy loyal Astartes of the Eisenstein would not join their fallen kin into damnation. Swearing an oath of moment upon Garrow's legendary blade, Libertas, the seventy dedicated their new purpose to fight and die to allow for their warning to reach the throne world. Allowing another renegade Sons of Horus Thunderhawk gunship to land within the frigate under the command of Third Captain Iacton Cruz, his refugees of the Iterator Kirill Sinderman and the Remembrancers Euphrates Keeler and Mercedes Oloton had found their sanctuary under the protection of Garrow. During conversation with Nathaniel, Keeler began to bolster his conviction in the Emperor's divinity, yet he would need more than belief to survive the trials ahead. Fleeing the Istvan system, their path to terror would be hounded by the intervention of the traitors, foul new benefactors. Evading the reprisal of Captain Typhon's flagship, the Terminus Est, the Eisenstein began its treacherous escape from the Istvan system. Sustaining heavy damage from the guns of the Terminus Est, every one of the astropaths aboard perished during the skirmish. The single surviving navigator had been wounded, and their traversal of the Immaterium seemed hopeless, yet under such circumstance, only one option remained. Blindly traversing the warp, the Eisenstein continued its perilous voyage to Terra. Yet within the roiling tides of the Immaterium, the Plague Lord Nurgle looked on with great amusement. Already claiming the souls of the Death Guard to his will, the Chaos God of Pestilence and Entropy saw to the creation of the first Plague Marines. Resurrecting Ignatius Grilgor and his men into the foul undead thralls of his will, the Plague Marine Primus once more attempted to claim revenge against his hated nemesis. Slaying the Eisenstein's navigator and infecting the Astartes Solon Decius with his plague knife, Grilgor's rampage within the vessel would be thwarted by Garrow's order to transition out of the warp. Dissipating with the loss of connection to the Immaterium, the Plague Marines fell once more. Stranded hundreds of light years from any known planet of the Imperium, the now adrift Eisenstein had suffered much, jettisoning the ship's warp drive into space. With its detonation, a powerful shockwave made by its destruction remained their last and only hope of distress. Drawing the attention of the Imperial Fist flagship, 
Phalanx, commanded by the Primarch of the Seventh Legion, Rogel Dawn, the crew of the Eisenstein, had been rescued. Meeting with the Vigilant within the command center of his gargantuan Void Fortress, Nathaniel Garrow in the presence of the survivors of the Vengeful Spirit denounced the War Master as a traitor to the Imperium. Erupting in a violent outburst at the insinuation that a son of the Emperor could ever betray their father, Rogel Dawn in his rage came close to ending the life of the Battle Captain of the 14th. Yet with the testimony of Captain Yakdon Cruz and the intervention of Mercedes Oloton's recording implants, Rogel Dawn began to accept the bitter truth that his once noble brother had turned from the Emperor's light. Traversing to the throne world to meet with the Emperor, upon their arrival to the Soul System, the Seventy required screening upon the Moon of Luna to assess them for signs of corruption. Imprisoned within the Somnus Citadel until their purity could be proven true, the Sisters of Silence watched over their charge until the judgment of the Master of Mankind could be ascertained due to his toil within the ruin of the Imperial Webway. Within the Medicaid facilities of the Somnus Citadel, Solon Decius's body fought in vain to resist the corruption of Nurgle's rot. Infected by the wound of Ignatius Grilgore's plague knife, Solon's unimaginable torture continued to weaken his resolve. Seeking any aid to deliver him from the agony that racked his body, the Lord of Decay whispered temptations into Solon's mind. Submitting to the will of Nurgle, Solon's body became possessed by the greater demon known as the Lord of Flies as it began to wreak havoc within the headquarters of the Silent Sisterhood. Transforming into a hideous abomination, the demon killed several sisters and a measure of the Loyalist Death Guard stationed within the Somnus Citadel in its escape attempt to reach Holy Terror. Confronted by Garrow upon the surface of Luna, Nathaniel would attempt to end his wayward battle brother's suffering. Banishing it into the roiling tides of the warp, Garrow's deeds further vindicated his actions as a true loyal servant of the Emperor. Meeting with Malkador the Sigilite alongside the Sister of Silence, Amandera Kendall, the Regent of Terror would appoint the two as his personal agents. Forming a clandestine order consisting of men and women of an inquisitive nature, the Emperor had foreseen a terrible future following the conflict that now sought to sunder his empire and required singular warriors to oppose the chaos to follow. Tasked with finding seven individuals of such a caliber necessary to build the foundations of this new order, Nathaniel now clad in grey Mark VI Corvus power armor, bearing the sigil of the Regent of Terror, ventured once more into the embattled galaxy. Keeping the battle ornament of his rank as battle captain, a decorative golden eagle sculpted of brass upon his armor's chest and gorget, protecting him from small arms fire, alike to an iron halo, Garrow also received a mastercrafted Paragon Bolter and a device known as Falsehood, which projected a psycholuminal distortion to allow Garrow to infiltrate war zones undetected. Now a Legion of One, Nathaniel Garrow as the Agentia Primus of the Sigilite, traveled to the world of Kalf. Recruiting the Ultramarine's librarian, Tylos Rubio, into his service as his lieutenant, Rubio's use of psychic powers in breach of the Edict of Nikea had seen him ostracized from the 13th Legion. Swearing an oath of moment upon Libertas, Rubio's induction to the Knights Errant would be followed soon after as the duo intercepted the fleeing vessel, Dagaline, housing survivors of the Istvan Free betrayal. Aiding the World Eater's 12th Captain, Mesa Varen, in vindicating his actions as a true loyal son of the Imperium, Varen would be the third to join Garrow's band of outcast warriors. With the aid of Malkador, and the latent Lunar Wolf Astarte Psyker, Severian, the Knights Errant would quickly grow into a force capable of launching covert operations throughout the galaxy. Inducting the Blood Angels Captain Seron, White Scar Niran, and mysterious Dark Angels Black Shield, known only as the Nemean Reaver, the Greyclad Warriors continued their works to organize a force capable of combating the treachery of the Shadow Wars besieging the Imperium. Yet upon the desolate world of Istvan Free, the final warrior to be inducted into Malkador's order would languish among the ashes of his fallen brothers. The catalyst of the Horus heresy now remained as little more than dust and bloodied soil. The sight of virus bombings, orbital bombardments of cleansing flame, 
and the sight of brothers killing brothers, Isvan Free remained as a graveyard of the lost and damned. However, among the debris and fell plague zombies littering the planet, a solitary Astartes remained. Captain Garviel Loken, the forsaken son of the War Master, had survived the countless atrocities of this barren world and in a state of treachery fueled insanity, roamed the planet. Garrow, Rubio, and Varen descended upon Istvan Free, only to find corpses both laying to rest and roaming the ruins of battle. Finding the dignified and preserved remains of the deceased sons of Horus captain, Tarek Dorgadon, the knights errant were set upon by the feral Cerberus of Istvan Free. Defending himself from the wild attacks of Garviel Loken, Nathaniel with the aid of Mesa Varen managed to breach the despair and trauma of Cerberus's mind and reached out to the long dormant yet noble warrior within. Offering Loken a chance at revenge against his treacherous brethren, within the shadow of the coral city of Istvan Free, Garviel Loken accepted the offer of Nathaniel to join the Knights Errant. Returning to the Moon of Luna, the Knights Errant continued their missions to delay and cripple the War Master's campaign across hundreds of clandestine missions across the stars. As each contingent of Knights Errant were dispatched among different assortments of specialists for each mission carried out to meet their expertise, in the downtime between missions, Nathaniel Garrow began to contemplate his purpose within the war effort. Seeking guidance from the revered living saint and former remembrancer, Euphrates Keeler, her miraculous abilities in facing the demonic entities of the warp and devotion to the Lacticio Divinitatis sparked further doubt within Garrow's conflicted mind. An adherent of the Imperial Truth, Nathaniel Regardless still felt moments of what could only be described as faith due to his continued battles survived against impossible odds. Meeting with Katona Tallery upon Terra's Riga orbital plate, the Administratum official had discovered suspicious activities of supply transports and siphoned resources of Terra, being transported to Saturn's largest moon, Titan. Uncovering an operation known as Ophrys, Katona sought aid from Garrow in uncovering the mystery behind her suspicions that traitors worked within their midst. Infiltrating the fortress monastery of Titan, Garrow and Tallery discovered a gigantic psychic construct being built within. Confronted by Malkador the Sigilite, the Regent of Terra revealed this secret project to be the culmination of his endeavors with the Knights Errant, authorized personally by the Emperor. Wary of Tallery's threat to expose the project and forewarn the traitor forces, Malkador ordered Garrow to execute the meddling administrator. Refusing to slay a devout follower of the Emperor's divinity, Malkador would relent and draft her to become the Curator Adepta Primus of the project. Destined to be the headquarters for the Grey Knights chapter following the end of the heresy, the last days of the Knights Errant approached. Fighting alongside his brother of the Seventy, Helig Galor, in the years preceding the final advance of the traitors, and further strengthening his bond with Euphrates Keeler, when conferring with the first captain of the Imperial Fists, Sigismund, Garrow discovered that he was not alone in believing that the Master of Mankind was indeed divine in nature. Protecting Keela from the corrupted Vindicari assassin, Aristide Kell, Garrow's duty to prevent the death of the living saint of the Imperium would not allow for any to harm the symbol of hope to endure the darkness to come. For the final battle to preserve humanity was imminent, a conflict which Nathaniel Garrow resolved to make his final stand. Combating demonic incursions throughout Terra alongside his battle brothers, Nathaniel Garrow once more fought the disgusting form of the Lord of Flies. Beneath the vast white mountains of Terra, Nathaniel looked upon the form of his reborn adversary. Revealing its host to be Garrow's stalwart brother, the apothecary Merrick Voyan, Nathaniel and his men fought with valor yet incurred casualties. Its host slain, the Lord of Flies continued its rampage by possessing those within its proximity. Attempting to corrupt Mesa Varen, the World Eater with a word of farewell to Garviel Loken detonated a brace of grenades, choosing to die free from corruption rather than live as a slave. With Malkador's intervention of psychic might, once more banishing the demon to the Immaterium, despite their victory, the work of the Knights Errant was far from over. 
assembling nine of their number to meet with the Master of Mankind personally. These psychically potent souls would be installed as the founding Grand Masters of the Order of the Grey Knights, and begin their task of building their new chapter upon the Moon of Titan. Refusing the honor, Garviel Loken in his rejection of the appointment to such a role had chosen to seek vengeance against his own treacherous Primarch, yet Nathaniel Garrow had not been given the opportunity to join his outcast kin due to his lack of psychic gifts. As the eight Titans of the Grey Knights began their vigil upon the time and space dilated moon of Titan, Malkador the Sigilite released Nathaniel Garrow from his service. Free to choose his own destiny, Nathaniel, alongside Garviel Loken, led his own band of warriors to face the traitors besieging the walls of the Imperial Palace. Garrow's kill team designated Strife, alongside Loken's Naismith, Galor Seventh, Endred Har's Black Dog, Sigismund's Devotion, Thane's Helios, and Belsepetus's Brightest. The renegade, outcast, and pilgrim Astartes defended the inner palace from the advances of the traitor assault. Defeating both Captain Falcus Kyber and Ezekiel Labadon's elite Jesteran companies, Garrow came close to ending the life of the first captain of the 16th Legion, despite the losses of Sepetus and Endrid during the battle. Nathaniel had survived a thousand battles and seen the deaths of many vaunted heroes and Astartes, yet even now a pit of uncertainty knotted in his gut. The Death Guard Legion, his once proud kin, began their assault of the Imperial Palace. His own Primarch Mortarion led the charge, and though Nathaniel had proven capable of escaping the embrace of death time and again, he knew now that he must confront the harbinger of his own demise. Grasping Libertas tight within his hands, Nathaniel Garrow faced death incarnate. Mortarion! The warrior in grey called out across the silenced battlefield. For terror's sake, and by the will of the Emperor of Mankind, I name you traitor. Traitor. The last word echoed about the ruins surrounding them, repeating off the broken walls and into the haze of war smoke. Mortarion's smile became brittle, fracturing into a sneer. A swift, stony fury came upon him at the denunciation, indignant rage stealing his limbs. <sighs> I have betrayed nothing, he hissed, answering the whispers in his mind before they could begin anew. The Primarch strode to the edge of the observation gallery and gripped the corroded rail there, tightly enough to compact the metal. He was aware of his warriors in the ranks below looking up at him, eager for his next order, conflicted by his inaction. The shout came again. You are corrupt. You have destroyed what you were sworn to protect. If one shred of what you once were still remains, then show it now. Face me, Jean Sire, if you have the courage. Garrow. Typhus uttered the name like a curse. It appears time has not diminished his arrogance only nurtured it. The great growth upon the traveler's back shuddered. The plague swarms nesting within the destroyer hive that shared the legionary's transformed body sensed the warrior's need to make murder, and they wanted to fulfill his desire. Grant me the right to dispatch, my lord. Say the word. Say it. For a moment, Mortarion considered the possibility. He need only nod, and Typhus would have his grave wardens gun down the knight errant and they would not kill Garrow with that opening salvo. No, they would likely cripple him, breach his armor, and render him unable to fight. Only then would his death begin, a long and tormented process that might last to the fall of terror and throne and beyond. It was a tempting prospect, but as with everything, Typhus offered his liege lord, it came with a cost. If Mortarion granted the kill to the first captain, then the sacramental power of Garrow's death would belong to Typhus the Traveler, not the Reaper of Men. Mortarion had learned that in his new, changed existence, the boon of Grandfather Nurgle required sacrifice. His body and those of his warriors had been remade, literally transformed into the undying ideal that was the dark soul of his legion. But the bargain has to be paid for, again and again, and the only coin of value was death. The death of a hero, of a believer, that has great worth. 
not just as a murder gift to Nurgle and his Gardens of Decay, but to the corrupted spirits of Mortarion's warriors. The changed way was still fresh upon them, and while many embraced the new flesh, others wavered. With his kill upon his scythe's blade, such a righteous kill indeed, the Primarch would reaffirm his mastery of his legion. No, he told Typhus. You are denied. Garrow's life belongs to me. Once he pledged it to my name. It is mine to end as I see fit. In spite of himself, Typhus snorted in derision. My wardens will obliterate that conceited fool. The Oathbreaker is not worth sullying your weapon. You would have me turn away from a challenge to my name? Mortarion's rasping voice became flinty. I question this. Typhus moderated his tone, but he did not back down. One legionary calls you to conflict. You gave Garrow more honor than he deserves. Then he paused, taking a husking, gurgling breath. Or is it that I do not see your full intent, my lord? He nodded to himself. Yes, that's it, isn't it? Garrow has always been a splinter in your eye. He is the death guard you could not turn to your will. When the moment came, he is your lapse, your failure. Belying its name, Mortarion's great war scythe, Silence, cut through the fetid air with a sharp hiss as the Primarch drew it from across his back. Tainted sunlight flashed off the corroded arc of the blade, and before Typhus could pull his own weapon, the cutting edge was pressing against his neck. <sighs> Take care how you speak to me, my brother, intoned the Death Lord. In times past, I have indulged you. I let myself be blind to your ambitions, but those days are over. <sighs> Remember your place, first Captain. I meant no disrespect, said Typhus, unwilling to move even the smallest degree while the blade threatened. I have always been truthful with you, even if you disliked what I say. At length, he found the will to back away a step, to distance himself from the weapon's killing arc. I speak the truth now. It is vanity to answer Garrow's challenge. It is beneath you. Perhaps so, allowed Mortarion. <sighs> But the decision is mine to make. He returned silence to its place and spoke again. These are my commands. Have the Legion stand down and give me fighting room. Father and son stood upon the battered earth of terror as both traitors and loyalists looked on. One a paragon of humanity's resolve, enriched in holy light. The other a terrible blight, shrouded in poison mist and fell power. It had been years since the Battle of Istvan III, the benighted sundering of the traitor legions from their righteous bonds and fealty to the master of mankind. Yet here, on this day, in the shadow of the Emperor's grand yet besieged palace, the last of the Dusk Raiders of Terror stood upon the ground of his birth world. Offering Garrow a chance to rejoin his former legion, Mortarion gifted only suffering should he refuse his kindness. Rejecting such a poisoned chalice from the creature who he had once revered, Garrow raised his sword Libertas aloft. Its crackling light shone like a beacon of hope within the mire of smoke and mist. Its brethren blades, forged prior to the age of old night, wielded by Kusanan of the Valorous, Xal, Vorpal, and Zulfikar, now lost to the ages, its keen edge would test its bite upon the flesh of a prince of abominations. A thousand enemies had perished by its blade, yet never before had it been raised in anger against a son of the master of mankind. But today, it would. As the two clashed, they would exchange barbed words, yet Garrow remained true to have never broken his oath to his legion and his gene sire. Libertas would shatter under the immense force of silence. The duel ended with the Knight of Grey, left at the mercy of the Pale King. Inky threads of toxicity were already eating into the Knight Errant's war gear, and where the scythe met flesh, it was poisoning him, dissolving his veins and nerves. The Primarch watched the shadow of death lengthen over Garrow's form. This time, 
he would not rise. Pinned in place against the blood-washed rubble, Garrow's body shook as one by one, each of his implants and vital organs began to shut down. His gene-hanced flesh and bones, the greatest weapons that the Emperor's science had gifted to him, were not immortal. His end was at hand. Nothing could stop that now. What would come next? Abyssal darkness? Or would there be some shining, transcendent moment of clarity as the light faded? To Garrow's surprise, what freed itself within him was a smile. He released a wet, broken chuckle. He understood his purpose now. Everything made clear. You know this, said Garrow, laboring every last word. When I die, Mortarion, your humanity dies with me, as is my wish, intoned the Primarch, tightening his grip on Silence Shaft. I no longer care for such concerns. Lie, managed Garrow, panting through a blood-filled mouth. I know truth. Hidden in your heart, you lie to yourself. You always have. He gritted his teeth and gave a bitter laugh. <laughs> in this moment, you sow the seed of your final defeat. Mortarion hesitated, frozen in place as Garrow's utterance registered with him. Even now, on the precipice of death, the legionary's words were inescapable. They were undeniable. From somewhere high atop the broken flanks of the Marmax Bastion, a flash of white light blossomed into being, and the drumming rumble of thrusters came like a clarion call. A machine in the shape of a winged bullet blasted itself out of the landing pad and cut a curving turn up and around the fallen tiers of the bastion. Typhus screamed wordlessly, and every projectile on the ground opened fire at once. The gathered Death Guard host bracketed the craft, vomiting bilious fire and lethal ejector into the air. A webwork of crisscrossing rocket shell contrails and ropes of searing tracer clawed after the heavy carrier as it skidded through the smoke overstressed engines howling as they pushed it towards the sky. Some of the ground fire clipped the fuselage and it veered wildly to avoid a terminal strike that might bring it down. Then, finding its pace, gaining traction against gravity and drag, their carrier shot towards the distant towers and armored precincts of the inner Imperial Palace. A double peal of thunder sounded as the craft breached the sound barrier and raced away at supersonic velocity. Garrow's hazy, pain-misted vision caught sight of the silver dart as it receded. He knew that Helig Galor was at the controls, with Euphrates Keeler and whoever remained of Costagar's surviving defenders in his charge. She is safe, he gasped. And you have failed, Mortarion. Whatever plan the Death Lord had, to take the saint as his prize for Horus Lupercal, to turn Garrow to the banner of the Warmaster's heretics, it was now a ruin, and the price of it was the life of the martyr. I pay the cost, Garrow told himself, as I was always meant to. This was the purpose towards which Nathaniel Garrow's path had been wrought, the moment in which he placed the existence of the saint before all else, the moment when he saved her. No, Mortarion's grave rasp rose into a furious snarl. Even in your death you hinder me. I, he breathed, gathering every last iota of strength still in his body, before the will leaked out into the thirsting dust along with his blood. I deny you your victory. You will never have what you wish. Such is the fate of Oathbreakers. This has been a tale of the great Imperium of Man, read by the Remembrancer. Nathaniel Garrow's sacrifice would forever resound for millennia to follow. His martyrdom made in the name of duty, honor, and his oath to serve the Imperium, instilling the greatest virtues of the stalwart defenders of humanity. Alike to Garrow, 
Never forget your oaths made to preserve the ones you cherish, even when all hope seems lost. For your will is unbreakable when compounded with duty. And in the bleakest of struggles, your reserve to preserve such principles is indomitable. <laughs>